Hello, I'm Dr. Visa Srinivasan, Medical Director of Health First Aging Services. I'm excited to welcome you all to the 16th Annual Caregiving for Seniors Conference. We are glad that we were able to offer this event to you virtually this year and thankful you've joined us today. Aging Services has an array of programs to meet the needs of our senior population. The services include a specialty geriatric outpatient clinic led by a geriatrician specifically trained to prevent and treat diseases and disabilities in older adults, our dedicated and passionate team of skilled nurse practitioners, nurses, and social workers work closely with family members and primary care physician to improve our patients' health and quality of life. We operate the Health First Memory Disorders Clinic through which we provide comprehensive diagnostic evaluations for people concerned with their memory. The findings are shared with the patient, their family, and their primary care physician. Thanks to the support of the Health First Foundation, we are also able to offer family caregivers with the information, tools, and skills to provide high quality care for their loved ones through the Center for Family Caregivers. Our program today will focus on empowering caregivers. We will begin with a workshop on caregiver fatigue presented by our keynote speaker, Dr. James Coyle. Next, our panel of experts will discuss mile markers during the caregiving journey, providing guidance and action tips for each mile marker. Last but not the least, we will conclude our program with helpful tools to help manage caregiver fatigue. Dr. Coyle and our live panel will address many of the issues and challenges that you face and will discuss various solutions, skills and resources that can help you take care of yourself as well as your loved one. I would like to thank the Health First Foundation and our sponsors for their support and for making it possible for us to share this information today. I would now like to invite Mr. Mike Maloney, Chief Operating Officer of Health First Medical Group, to share a few words. Welcome to our 16th annual Caregiving for Seniors Conference and to our first as a virtual event. Health First is grateful to again be able to offer this event to our community at no cost. Thanks to our sponsors at the Health First Foundation and our conference partners at Health First Center for Family Caregivers. Our goal is to ensure that the caregivers in our community have the support they need to care for their loved ones and that they have the tools they need to maintain their own well-being. November is National Caregivers Month. Let's take a moment to honor all of you who selflessly provide for the health and well-being of your family members, friends, and neighbors. We recognize your challenges. We admire your care and compassion. We applaud your dedication, and we appreciate your unwavering commitment to ensure your loved ones stay the course with health, safety, and dignity. At Health First, our mission is to positively impact the wellness and health of the communities we serve. We are here today in that spirit to provide you with education, hope, and renewed strength to support your caregiving efforts. We are also here today to keep you well while you care for others and be a resource for, for you throughout your journey. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors this year for their generous support, with special recognition to our signature sponsors, the Vieira Company and Delta Dental. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Tiffany Overott, one of our social workers at Health First Aging Services, to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you for being with us today. We hope you enjoy the conference. Reading his resume hardly does justice for the breadth of this man's dedication and skills but Dr. Coyle holds a doctorate in counseling and currently serves as a grief care specialist for the Cedar Group in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He is a nationally certified licensed clinical counselor, a dedicated educator at a local community college, the author of GPS, Your Guide Through Personal Storms, and Tools for Life, Daily Inspirational Readings, and has been an inspirational speaker and trainer all over the country. Dr. Coyle is a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security, was recently honored as the Distinguished Member of the Year for his work in Haiti, and serves as a regional team leader for the state of Iowa. 
Dr. Coyle has also been an entrepreneur and business owner for 25 years, pioneering several churches and private counseling practices. He is anchored and fueled by his wife, five children, and two grandchildren. Again, it is my great honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. James Coyle. Well, good morning, and uh, in a while, it'll be a good afternoon as well. I'm Dr. Jim Coyle, and I have the absolute honor of walking beside you um, for this incredible event. And I know that we've had to postpone it. I was hoping to meet you guys, all of you, in person. But uh, I'm excited to be part of the Health First Center for Family Caregivers. This is the 16th annual conference. So um, just, uh, Tiffany, thank you for your kind words as well. But I'm excited to be with you and, and to uh, just try to walk beside you on this incredibly difficult year. I don't know about you, but 2020, oh, it's been a tough one um, in so many aspects, physically, emotionally, spiritually. And as caregivers as you are, all the added stressors that we've experienced with the pandemic, um, with uh, the hurricanes and, and uh, fires that are going on currently, there are so many things around us. And yet we're, we're in our worlds right now, in your individual world, trying to manage and cope with all of these things. So I get to walk beside you here and I'm very, very honored to do that. Um, I know Tiffany had mentioned part of my background uh, is I am with the Department of Homeland Security. This year alone, I have had seven deployments. I was at Travis Air Force Base when the initial COVID hit with the, China, the planes from China that came over. And then, yeah, I don't know if you can think back on the Princess Cruise Lines. All of the, those folks um, got off the, the uh, cruise ship and they came under our care. And then I spent 58 days in New York City working with the decedents of, uh, of the pandemic, along with uh, the riots and, and other things that were going on there in, in New York City. <clears throat> and then I was uh, in the South Coast uh, in Texas very recently. And we had a thing here. I'm in Iowa. And we had an event here in Iowa called the Duration. And the duration was sustained winds of 140 miles an hour for 40 straight minutes. We had over $200,000 worth of damage to our home personally. I'm in my office. Yay. So it's, it's coming together little by little. We're getting there. Um, all that to tell you that this year has been absolutely incredible for all of us. So... I'm, I'm, the things that I'm going to share with you and the things that I'm going to walk beside you with are things that I have to implement into my daily life in order to keep moving and to keep surviving. So we're going to talk about um, caregiver fatigue uh, in, in our morning session here and how all that uh, really affects us. And so... Um, as I transition into my wonderful slides to, to help us understand the power of these situations that we have been in. So um, here we are with our Health First Center for Family Care, the 16th Annual Caregivers Conference. Very excited to be with you guys. Um, I, I was so looking forward to coming to Florida where I could meet you face to face. Uh, and uh, the, the things that have gone on virtually in my line of work and what I do, I do full-time death care um, and uh, the latter seasons of life and helping people transition. Uh, things have had to go virtual. And so here we are with this conference going virtual. I'm so glad we were able to pull this off for you and for me as well. So uh, our next precious minutes that we have, we will definitely be um, covering a lot of things called uh, caregiver fatigue. So um, I want us to grasp hold of this quote. Self-care is giving the world the best of you 
instead of what's left of you. You know, um, I know I, I never wake up with my cup full, ever. Uh, my wife's got her, uh, she's a counselor at a middle school and working with all the, the kids right now and the dysfunctions of the, the pandemic and, and the parents and, and all that she does, she is, she is definitely on the front lines as well as, as all of us um, of trying to get through this. But I know that what we're going to talk about is just taking care of you. So no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad it gets or how tough it is, we still have to keep moving forward. And so I'm going to spend our next precious, valuable minutes uh, walking beside you. Have you ever felt like this? You know, um, I've been in fire and rescue since 1980. And this is an actual picture out of Clark County, uh, Nevada, uh, in Las Vegas, where a dog tried to jump between two palm trees. Well, didn't quite make it. And I use this picture because the only way that this dog could get out of this very difficult situation is he had to have help. And so we, we assisted him. You know, and, and we had to lift him from the bottom and push him up to kind of wedge him out. But think about your life. This is what fatigue, ha when, when we're fatigued or when we're stressed, these are the things that happen to us. We get stuck. We don't even know how or why, sometimes why. But how are we going to get out? So for those of you that can relate to this like me, um, we're going to look at some techniques of understanding the dynamics of stress and the fatigue that's associated with caregiving. I'm going to give you a model, and this is a model of help. Just like what our little friend needed, he needed help. This is what I need. I need help. So there's an acronym that I'm using for help, and it's called H for hope, E is for encouragement, L is for lifelines, and P is for purpose. And so think of your role as a caregiver. You're providing hope. You're providing encouragement. You're giving your uh, wonderful people that you're caring for a lifeline, something to hold on to and giving them purpose. So you are providing help to your wonderful uh, family members or whatever their role is in your life as you are their caregiver. So now I'm gonna reverse that because I need help and you need help as well. I need to have hope, encouragement. I need to have something to hold on to and purpose. And so I have a diagram here that I wanna share with you. You can see my, I have a friend who, her name is Aubrey. Uh, I met Aubrey uh, when she was 16 years old. Aubrey had a difficult, uh, has a difficult story, and I asked her to draw this for me. Aubrey's autistic, and uh, she actually went, she, she provided this drawing for me, which is absolutely perfect. So if you see my little mouse here, my little mouse, um, this was Aubrey, stuck in a ditch, very similar to the, the uh, dog that we saw that was stuck in a tree, but nowhere to go, absolutely stuck. So let me tell you Aubrey's story. Aubrey found her dad who had completed suicide. Two months later, Aubrey attempted suicide. And so I met Aubrey at one of our local hospitals here and began to walk beside her in, in this difficult journey of just being stuck, stuck in, in her, her stuff that, that put her in that ditch. And so she actually drew this for me because what you see here is you see Three different types of response. Now, I'm going to assume 
that this is you right now because I am here constantly. As I go through this, you're going to see where you are here and you are here as well. But let's look at this. So just for sake, this is going to be me right now with some of the difficulties that, that I've experienced. And um, by the way, I, I do want to side note and tell you that I was a caregiver for both of my parents. Um, both of my parents died in my arms. One was, uh, I would call, a very sweet transition. The other one was difficult. Now, I'm a very faith-based man. Um, uh, and um, comforting my dad, my, I was with my dad for his last oh, three years. He had cancer, and I watched the cancer eat him away. And I was his caregiver along with mom, but mom was having her challenges. And, and so I used to go in the, and be with my dad uh, every single day. Every day I played gin rummy with him, and I just, I was with him. And uh, I, I held him in my hands when he took his last breath. And I saw some incredible things that he not only lived and shared with me, but as I, I held him, I watched him experience before his final breath as he witnessed something on the other side of what we call our earthly life. He saw something over there and then he died. And I'm telling you what, when he took his last breath, that, oh, you can't even prepare for it as much as you think you would like to. For those of you that have lost loved ones that you've cared for, um, and I'm sure there, there's a multitude of you that have, uh, you, can't, you, you can't prepare for it. When my dad took his last breath, I lost my best friend. He was, he was my best man at my wedding. I lost my mentor, my trainer, my, my father figure, my hero died right there and I died with him and I, I tell you I I struggled for a very long time with trying to see how I was going to be able to move forward in the absence of my hero um, nine years later uh, my mom uh, who fought and fought and fought she had cancer as well <clears throat> and Toward the end of her uh, transition, it was extremely difficult. So um, I held my mom, but my mom was having seizures. There wasn't enough morphine that could take the pain away from her. And uh, I remember uh, when she died and she took her last breath, she was right in the middle of one of those violent seizures. She was unconscious, but I know that she was feeling the pain. And uh, as, as she writhered in that pain, and when she died, I died with her. A piece of me died with her as well. So um, in caregiving, uh, I've been a caregiver, like you said, pretty much all of my life in, in all kinds of different things. I focus, I'm a first responder now, but I focus on end of life um, care and life after immediate death care. So um, I, I thank God for the things that I've learned over my lifetime that have helped me keep going. But all that to say, as you as caregivers, I am wrapping my virtual arms around you to say, you know what? Thank you for doing what you're doing. We can do this, but let me give you some tools. Let me try to help you understand this process. So back to Aubrey, who wrote out, um, who drew this picture for me. This is me. Many times, I, so this is me. There are three responses to me. While I'm in my ditch or I'm stuck in my tree. Here are the three responses. Let me see if you can relate to these. Here's one response that will look down at me and say, you know what? It's not all that bad. You're going to be okay. Time will heal. Things are okay. Hey, let's go, let's go grab a pizza. Let's go grab a burger. 
you know, this person means well, but they don't understand the depth of my struggle, the depth of what's involved in caregiving. They don't quite understand it. So here's another response. And this is a person or a place or a thing that becomes part of the problem. That's why they're in the ditch rather than part of the solution. So this is the person that would look to me and say, <clears throat> wow, you think you got it bad? Well, let me tell you about me. And so what is taking place is that they are holding me hostage to their problems and we are both an anchor in this ditch. Now, this could be uh, a thing, a thing that somebody could um, become attached to that also becomes part of the problem. A thing might be a self-destructive behavior pattern. It might be drugs. It might be alcohol. It could be gambling. It could be binge eating. It could be a, a ton of things that we attach ourselves to while we're down here, hoping that it would alleviate and take the pain away. But in all reality, that thing becomes part of the problem rather than part of a solution. Let's talk about a place. A place might be a bar. A place might be a casino. A place might be a shopping mall. A place might be a buffet. All of these different things that could really attach themselves to a self-destructive behavior or something that I'm involved with that becomes part of my problem rather than part of the solution. So this, again, could be a person, a place, or a thing. So the one that we're going to focus on up here is this, too, could be a person, place, or thing. Now, you will see in Aubrey's drawing, she was wonderful. This is a rope attached to a tree. <clears throat> and the tree is the foundation and then wrapped around uh, the waist and then offering a lifeline. Okay, so I'm going to be up here now for a minute. In fire and rescue, safety is always first. If we are going to rescue somebody, we want to make sure that we are secured into whatever we, we need to be for that moment. Whether it's a water rescue or whether it's a rescue out of a tree, it doesn't matter. Wherever the rescue is, safety is always first. And so you'll see what Aubrey did here for me. Is she drew a Satan me as a first responder, as a caregiver, being attached to a foundation called Lifelight. And then I'm, then I'm able to offer support a lifeline here. So uh, those are the three responses to me being in a ditch. And that would be somebody that looks at me and says, it, it, it's going to be okay. It's not all that bad. Or this could be the person, place, or thing that becomes part of the problem. Or this is the person, place, or thing that becomes a resource for me and a guide to help me out of my ditch. So let's go back to our acronym. The first letter of help is hope. And so let me tell you what hope does. Hope opens people's eyes. H-O-P-E. <clears throat> hope opens people's eyes. So what we are doing or what you are doing and what you're even doing for me right now, because family, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm here and, and I rotate, but now you guys are all even offering me. This workshop is a wonderful, this conference is a wonderful lifeline for so many, including myself. And so what hope does, it allows me to look up and over and beyond the circumstances that I'm in. It gives me the ability to see beyond the things that I'm stuck in. That's what hope 
does. Hope opens people's eyes. So the next letter is encouragement. And uh, Aubrey has a little heart in here. I remember meeting with her, you know, and giving her help, giving her hope, something to see beyond where she was at and the encouragement. And so if I had a little heart, and I'm drawing one right now with my little cursor, a little heart. What encouragement does is it allows the heart to beat again. So I want to share uh, a very difficult time that I experienced one time with my wife. My wife had been training, and my wife's a caregiver too, you know. And, uh, my, my wife had been training for a marathon. I can't remember. It's, it's over 20 miles long. It's like 24.2 or 26.4, something like that. She had been uh, training for this, and it was her first marathon that she ran in. I was really proud of her to be able to do that. I'm at the finish line with my cell phone, ready to take pictures of her, and I'm so proud of her. And somebody ran up to me and said that, my wife had collapsed and she was a quarter of a mile away. I never ran so fast in my life. I got to be in the back of the ambulance with her where she flatlined. Her heart just went. And so they, they, they did the power of the fibrillator. They just pumped her three times in an ambulance to get a heartbeat, three separate times. Her heart was beginning to get a beat again. We got to the hospital and it flatlined. She flatlined again. And this was a bad one. They, and she was going into convulsions as well. And I remember there were three people on her gurney holding her down while they zapped her again and again to try to get the heart stimulated. And her heart came back. And it began to beat. And I remember after she got out of the hospital, we went to the uh, quarter of a mile where she fell down and, and collapsed. And, and I walked with her. We walked to the end, to the finish line, just to allow her to finish that. But um, I share that story with you because I, in my own life, have flatlined many times. When I say flatline, that means I just don't have a heartbeat anymore. It's hard. It's hard to even function. And so what um, the encouragement does is it brings a heartbeat back here that I witnessed with my wife, that I have witnessed for me with me. I remember sitting in bed sometimes uh, so overwhelmed with the stressors around me that I had a remote control vegged on TV going through every channel and not even aware of what's going on, just trying to sedate this, this flat line. <clears throat> so think about yourself. Think about the encouragement that you have received over your lifetime. Um, it could have been a word. It could have been a meal. It could have been a movie, you know, signs and, 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 uh, sometimes gifts that we get provide a lifeline without sufficient words. Words may not even need to be shared, but they are uh, in place of those things. And those give us encouragement. So just reflect on a moment when somebody encouraged you out of nowhere, whether it was a person, a place, or a thing. And what that did for your heartbeat. That's what encouragement is. These lifelines are huge. Uh, the next letter that we look at is the L for lifelines. Now, I'm going to call us family from this point forward. Family, we have uh, been here. We have been here. The lifelines are the roots. These are the foundations that keep us from going off the edge. These lifelines are incredible. 
So I have several. In fact, I'm going to challenge you to begin to, even now, identify some lifelines in your life. My wife is a lifeline. My faith, my God is a lifeline. We have three dogs. One of them is a therapy dog. These dogs are lifelines for me. I'm a sports guy, and the World Series is on tonight. I'm a huge Dodgers fan. But the sports become a lifeline for me. And so what the lifelines do is they give us something to hold on to when we are in a very difficult spot. And these lifelines, I think I identified five or six out of mine. Um, I enjoy movies. I enjoy golf. Golf is a mental health escape for me. Even when I can't play it, I'll shut my eyes. I can play nine holes in five minutes. I've done it all the time. And doing that, that has really helped me um, combat the different stressors. So <clears throat> my challenge to you is to identify 10 lifelines in your life. And um, that'll be a homework assignment for me to give to you. Because those are 10 things that you're passionate about. Those are 10 things that mean more than anything to you. Those are 10 things that you hold on to. And if you can hold on to those, those things will help you during these uh, times of being in the ditch. We're not always there. In fact, if I go back to this picture, right now I'm here. I'm a lifeline for Health First Center, Health First Center for Family Care. What an honor to be a lifeline to offer tools to help us hold on to. And then here. So you as a caregiver, you're here and you're here just like me. Every day, these go back and forth. And that's why it's so important to begin to understand these things in your life that really are a stability for you. They're an anchor for you for something to hold on to when the storms come. So the last letter is the letter P, which stands for purpose. Purpose is, is incredible. I, I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, I don't know if you've experienced this yet, but I'm sure that you will. A loved one that you're caring for. Um, loses a very significant other person. Maybe it's a parent that loses uh, their spouse. Uh, it could be such a devastating loss that that person has no reason to live anymore. I just met with a lady um, a few days ago. Her son had completed suicide and she has cancer. And she's in her late 70s. And she just honestly told me, she said, man, I've never experienced this kind of pain. And I just want to die. I, I, I don't have any reason to get up anymore. And I'm so glad that she was able to reach out and, and get a hold of me. Because we all have to have a little purpose. A purpose to continue. And so we may need to identify what those things are. Maybe you, you have grandkids. They're a purpose to continue to live. Maybe it is your dog. Maybe it is your pet. Maybe it's something that you can continue to make a difference in doing. But we all need a purpose to continue to be motivated. So in revisiting this health model, here's what we do as caregivers we provide help. We bring hope. We bring encouragement. We offer lifelines. And we offer purpose, you know, to find and direct a purpose to continue to live, to continue, even though you, the, the people we're dealing with, I can tell you that uh, the people that are, are at the end like this, they have their faith. They have their God. And that's kind of motivating them to move forward. Uh, to die. So um, to try to find that significant reason to live. Even you could be your caregiver's purpose. When you walk in that door, 
or if you're living with them and they see your smile and you're there, it gives them a reason to live. So you become that purpose for them in, in their difficult season as well. And that's what we want about this wonderful help model does. So um, in moving forward, Neil, what I want to talk about is some of the symptoms and uh, the signs of fatigue. Because all of these have effects on us. I'm going to talk about three things. The first thing is your head. And then I'm going to talk about your heart. Your feelings. And then I'm going to talk about your actions. You know, it's, it's an incredible thing. My own... My dad taught me a lot of things in life. One of, the th one of the main things that he did teach me. He said, Jim, the hardest 18 inches in life are from your head to your heart. Your head to your heart and your heart to your head. Head to heart, heart to head, head to heart. This journey that goes back and forth, back and forth, will always dictate what you do with your hands. So I'm going to call this the triple H factor. It's your head, it's your heart, and it's your hands. So here's how it works. Your head is what you think of. This is how I process. This is what consumes a lot of people. And um, people that are stuck in depression, <clears throat> and I'll be honest with you, I've battled depression throughout my life. So, um, I was 19 years old and I attempted suicide. I understand the dark side of depression. I had the fire department save my life. And then after I, my life got saved, um, I began to find a new purpose. And uh, I've been on fire since 1980. That's how long, you know, even giving back to the fire, fire um, department as a firefighter that so um, on our fire department here in Cedar Rapids, I'm the, the mental health um, um, person, and I'm also the chaplain. I serve on the state of Nevada, uh, or excuse me, in the state of Iowa over several counties as the liaison for what we call critical incident stress um, management, CISM or CISD, kind of a name, but... Um, I am so grateful because of the things that I've been through in my life that are allowing me to even be here with you today. So all of those things are a result of trying to get my head and my heart and my hands back on the same page. So this is a war zone up here. What, are, what captures my thoughts? Because there are things, if, if I get locked into something negative, um, I, I stay there and then I focus on that and then I'm stuck. And so I'm going to give you tools even later this afternoon of how to maybe unlock some of the, the, the thoughts that we are imprisoned to. 18 inches, the heart. These are my feelings. This are my emotions. <clears throat> They're separate than your than your thoughts. And it's interesting how we are designed with thinking, our emotions, with our actions. They're all separate, and yet we have to take care of them individually to get them all on the same page. Here's what I know. When I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and what I'm doing, if all three of those are on the same page, we call that integrity. That means I'm going to have a good night's sleep. What I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, and what I'm doing are all on the same page. So I want to stir up the thought process with you, and then we'll dive into this a little bit more. I want you to stir this up. My head says, do it. And my heart says, no, 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 don't do it. And I end up doing it. Oh, now I feel horrible because I've just done something that in my heart was the wrong thing to do. And then I try to sleep. Well, that doesn't work. 
So let's do it. Let's play this again in your world, stirring it up. Your head says, don't do it. And your heart says, do it. And I end up doing it. Now I've done something that I know better. I shouldn't have done it. And now I have stress with that. And I'm going to try to put my head on my pillow at night and I'm going to try to sleep. That's a real difficult thing to do. So trying to manage your thoughts, trying to manage your emotions, and then trying to manage your behaviors because everything we do is related to a thought or an emotion or both of them together. And so the best stress-free life that you can live is connecting your head, connecting your heart, and then connecting your actions with it. So with that being said, I want to talk about some of the stressors that are involved in managing our thoughts, managing our emotions, and then managing our actions. So here are some symptoms of caregiver fatigue. I'm constantly feeling tired, even after having time to rest. I have physical tension in my body when it's not needed. I could be sitting at my desk. I could be driving in the car. And all of a sudden, I got tension. I have physical pain throughout the day, such as a headache. Could be a back pain. Could be a wrist pain, but I just push through it. I have difficulty falling asleep. Or I have difficulty waking up. Here's one that always got me. Um, I would fall sick the moment I went on vacation. So um, I, I've got to share this with you. We, I got my grandkids or I got my kids. Um, we have five kids. And we set up a trip to go to Hawaii. Um, all of us. And, and uh, this was before the, the little munchkins um, started arriving, the grandkids. So my whole thing, and I spent a ton of money on this, where we went to this wonderful island of Kauai. And I don't know if you guys have ever been to Hawaii, it's a, it's a, it's a great island to visit. It's called Kauai. And we stayed there. <clears throat> the minute I got there, here we are in the midst of paradise. And I got sick. I remember laying in bed in Hawaii because I, I couldn't move. And, and my family still went up. They snorkeled. They did excursions. And here was dad stuck back at the wonderful resort, um, sicker than a dog. Um, but what I learned from that is that I have to take care of myself. Is because here's what, what would happen. I'm, I pour myself so much into what I do. If you can tell, I'm extremely passionate, extremely passionate about what I do. And I get into it. And then when I got away, I never took time off. And so um, I really had to learn how to balance myself so I wouldn't get sick on vacations. That's not a good thing. I don't know if you guys can relate to that. Yuck. I, uh, in fact, now I'm the other end. If I know there's a vacation coming up, I am preparing myself. I do not want to get sick. So let's talk about your heart. These are emotions. So in your heart, when we are fatigued, we get emotionally charged. We're hypersensitive. Maybe we feel disconnected from the emotions in our body. I could feel guilt or have guilt because maybe I have more resources than, than those that I'm caring for. Here's one. No matter how much I give, it's never enough. And I feel helpless or hopeless toward the future. And this is a very difficult place because that's what really leads to depression. Feeling helpless or hopeless. Here's one, and I know that when I'm under stress, 
I become a little bit more irritable. So my anger may increase. Irritability. I might have resentment or I might have cynicism. Cynicism. But all of those things become very much a part of my emotions. So now let's talk about what goes on in my head. Whew. We just talked about my heart. Now let's talk about my head. Now I'm, I'm having a hard time even processing a solution. Now maybe, maybe my thought part of that is I become part of the problem now. Remember then the ditch where I'm, maybe my thoughts I'm becoming part of the problem rather than part of the solution. My perspectives are, have shifted. In fact, I have difficulty in seeing multiple perspectives. I jump to conclusions. I have very rigid thinking. I have difficulty being thoughtful and deliberate. Here's a question in my head. Is anything that I'm doing effective? Am I, may, am I making a difference? Um, sometimes minimizing the suffering of others in comparison to others that are more severe. Those can lead to difficult thoughts. And here's one that I have to deal with all the time. Intrusive thoughts and imagery. And so this could be related to an experience. Um, I'll, I'll share a, a little comedy with you. But I deal with these intrusive thoughts and they come out of nowhere. So I'm at a city council meeting here in Cedar Rapids. And uh, the chief of police is a very close friend of mine. I love him dearly. And he went up to address the city council. So I'm just behind him. He's wearing his gun and his holster. Here's an intrusive thought. Hey, Jim, grab his gun. Are you serious? Are you kidding me? Where the heck did that thought come from? So... These are intrusive thoughts. And if, if my boundaries aren't, aren't up and I'm not kind of uh, maybe a, a little secure in my thinking, some of these thoughts can lead to irrational behavior. So I'm driving down the street one day and there was a jogger on the side of the road. Here's an intrusive thought. Hey, Jim, just nudge her. You know, take the car and bumper. You're going to get 10 points. Well, what the heck, man? What kind of a thought is that? You know, and that was from my childhood because we, we used to make games, you know, like that. And it was just silly. But these are intrusive thoughts that if they get into us and we are not on guard, they could lead to a rational and erratic behavior. And I'm telling you right now, if you haven't been caught with an irrational behavior, you probably will before long. I know that I have. And uh, it's just getting back. This is what our lifelines do. And that's why I want you to identify those 10 lifelines. Because if we do do something irrational, I can get back in. Oh, wait, that's not me. I'm going to pull myself back in, in into my space that is healthy and not not so much. So, let's talk about our actions. Sometimes if I'm fatigued, I don't want to go to work or I'm not going to show up. I'll avoid relationships, responsibilities. The things that used to be positive or even neutral are no longer positive. I don't even have any, anything to do with them. Here's another behavior thing, and we talked about this. We're using behaviors to escape eating, or to escape. It could be eating, alcohol, caffeine, TV, shopping, work. And those, are, those could be a destructive behavior pattern. So those are some symptoms. Now what I want to do is spend a few minutes uh, shifting a gear. Um, 
and talking about uh, things that, that we can help with. And I know in, in the afternoon session, um, I'm really going to give you, I'm, I'm going to come back and give you 10 tools of how to combat the stressors of 2020, not only as a caregiver, but with everything else. And I'm really looking forward to that afternoon session with you. Um, but uh, before we get into maybe some other uh, ways to combat this, some of the relationships that we are involved with will change as a result of our stress, as a result of our fatigue. Um, absence of our personal life. And the only way we survive is if it's in a work mode. We're, and, and then the last thing that I, will, I wanted to talk about here is where we isolate ourselves completely from others, only interacting with people who are in, in the same field or who can relate to my experience. So let's talk about self-care for these next several minutes and, and then uh, we'll break. Um, the first thing is to recharge your batteries. Oh, well, how do you do that? What is that? Um, recharging your batteries, and, and, and I'll spend some time on this this afternoon, but it could be regular exercise, it could be an activity, something to re-energize yourself. Okay, so here's what I know, family. Um, even yesterday, here's my cell phone. Even yesterday, I was at a conference. Uh, I was out of, out of town, uh, and um, my battery light came on. You know, with that red light, it says you're under 20% or you're under 10%. You know what's fascinating is that when this phone of mine begins to die, I will go all out to recharge it. Here's the reality of what just happened. I'm on this trip, it was a two-day trip, and I forgot to take my charger. So at night, I had to drive to a place just, at, you know, I left the, the hotel and where, where we were um, having our conference and to buy a phone charger. So I took, uh, it's funny, I, I go to one place and they didn't have it. I go to another home and they wanted too much money and blah, blah. I was gone for 45 minutes chasing a battery charger but i got it I plugged it in and even right now i'm at 98 percent. yay so why did i bring that up to you because we will charge our phone but what are you doing to charge yourself we must and we, we need to recharge and re-energize ourselves in, in the capacity that will then hopefully you're going to get some tools to do that. The second thing is to hold one focused, connected, meaningful relationship each day and one unintentional one. I can tell you that um, personally, I put this and I, me I mentioned that I am a, a man of faith, but I ask for a divine appointment every day, one appointment every day. In fact, uh, when my wife and I leave, leave each other during the day, we always pray for, you know, that one appointment. It happens every single day. And then, you know, the reality is I put my head on my pillow at night and I think about my day. What was the, the most gratifying, fulfilling thing today? It was when I was used in a way that I was not anticipating. Oh, my gosh. That is so cool to be part of a divine appointment. So... Put that on your agenda. Balance your relationships. You know, um, try to, if, if you are consumed with caregiving uh, and it's 24 and 7, uh, try to figure something out to balance that. Um, start thinking about a way that, that you can kind of escape that. There are ways, there are creative things that you can do. So begin to do that. Be intentional. That means if you are overwhelmed with somebody, talk to somebody. You know, you're taking this incredible, uh, not taking your part of an incredible conference today. 
as this is beginning to fill your tank. This is wonderful. Be intentional. Do the things that you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, awareness is, is very important. Awareness is uh, something we're talking about today. Caregiver fatigue, compassion fatigue. Become aware of it and, and then assess yourself for it. Uh, debriefing is talking to somebody that understands you. Um, spend plenty of quiet time alone. So I have to share another story with you guys. Um, I was at a very stressed out season in my life, and this is way back when Johnny Carson, for those of you that don't know who Johnny Carson is, had a late night show. And I know I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior citizen right now. I was under so much stress. Let me tell you what happened was going on. We had twins, and they were babies. They were like just born, two, three months old. They're not sleeping regularly. I was working on that time. I was working on my master's degree. And I had all my books in my closet. Um, as I was trying to study away from all the noise, we had three other kids at home. I was working full time. I was stressed out. And I'll never forget. I was like in that flat line. I turned on Johnny Carson. And out on the stage walks this little, little old lady in her little white gown. And it was Mother Teresa. Oh, man. The ultimate caregiver of all time. I love Mother Teresa. I, um, I studied her life, you know, because my background, uh, I've got my doctorate, counseling, my master's in counseling. Everything was about taking care of people. Whew, caregiver ultimate. So here's what Johnny Carson does. He gets up in his Johnny Carson way and he looks at her and says, how do you do it? How do you do it? And here was Mother Teresa. She says, I spend four hours a day with my God. What? Four hours a day with my God. And I sat back and I do it. Here's a woman that probably works 16 to 18 hours a day. Family, when I go on a deployment, we work 14 to 16 hours a day, every day, nonstop. I did that in New York City for 58 straight days. And so here's Mother Teresa in a world that she just gives and gives. She spends four hours a day with her God. And I just learned something from that. I began to implement a quiet place, a quiet time for my life. If you guys haven't done this, I encourage you to do it. You know, start small and then work your way up. I worked my way up back then to about an hour and a half, which was an hour and a half I didn't have. So even... Even today, quiet time is so critically important for me. Um, it's, it's one of those things that fuel me to be able to continue to do. So spend some quiet time. Find that spot. All right. As we begin to wrap this up, I want to... Um, there we go. Sorry about that. As we begin to wrap this morning session up... Um, I want to uh, encourage you. Here's what I know about you. There are three things that make you absolutely exceptional as a caregiver. You're giving it all you got. And you really have no choice. Because as caregivers, 
we have to wake up in the morning and put our boots on and give it all we got, no matter what's in our tank. That's what makes you exceptional. Here's one I want to challenge you with, because um, making the right choices. These are what make us exceptional. Remember the choices they govern our, our thoughts and our emotions and then our actions. Here's a stickler for you. The average adult makes 35,000 choices a day. The average adult makes 35,000 choices a day. Now, you, my friend, my family and friends, are above normal. You're above average. Why are you above average? Because you're helping others make decisions as well. So not only are you making an average of 35,000 choices a day, but why don't you add another 10 or 15,000 choices onto that? And so that's why it's very important to do the right thing uh, to make the right choice. So here's a good question for you. How do you know what's right or wrong? How do you know if it's the right choice? That's the importance of your lifeline because those will serve boundaries for your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. And if you can stay within your boundaries, all those passions, that will help guide you to make sure that you do the right thing. Because you'll know when you don't do the right thing. Your hands will tell you. Your heart will tell you, or your thoughts will tell you. So the third thing that makes you exceptional is you're always, always, always helping someone. We as caregivers model this way of life. We get up, we give it all we got. We have to do the right thing. Well, how do we know what the right thing is? We got to make sure our head, our heart, and our hands are on the same page. And then the beautiful thing is we're always helping someone. You know what happens when we help someone? It takes our mind even off of our personal stuff. I have to tell you that um, we ex recently experienced this horrific disaster here in Iowa called the Duration. I was on a deployment in Texas dealing with uh, the COVID pandemic down in, on one of the border towns that were overwhelmed. And so we were augmenting the clinicians. We were augmenting the, the hospital staff. And I was doing mental health work and uh, chaplain work and, and all that stuff, what I do to bring to the table. My wife calls me and she says, this disaster just hit Cedar Rapids. Cedar Rapids was dark, you guys, totally totally dark and um, no lights. We were without power here for nine days. And uh, I told my wife, I said, baby, you want me to come home? And she said, no, there's nothing you can do. And you know what she did every day? She went out into the community and helped. She teaches at a middle school that is in a, in a harder area that got hit. She was down there getting food, clothing, moving trees. Unbelievable. Oh, I am married to an incredible caregiver who lives out the way that we just talked about. Um, giving, them, giving it all you got, making the right choices, and always helping someone. You know, 2020 has been a tough year. Oh, it's been a tough year. And sometimes you just have to bow your head. You have to say a prayer. You have to weather the storm. You know, it's incredible. We just, we had a new roof put on about a week and a half ago. And it's been two months and we had leaks in our, all throughout our house, you know, all throughout it. Water damage, every time it rained, the water would still come through the roof. But last night we had another one of those incredibly windy storms that brought in over three inches of rain here in Iowa. Our roof made it. We didn't have any leaks in our house. And I'm telling you what, sometimes you just have to bow your head 
say a prayer and weather the storm. Here's also what I know about us caregivers. There's all kinds of bends in the road. But a bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. We all are making the turn. And I love this. Stay close to people who feel like sunshine. Stay close to them. Let those be one of your lifelines or your friends that make you feel like sunshine. I love Charlie Brown. Worrying won't stop the bad stuff from happening. It just stops you from enjoying the good. And I know that in losing loved ones, it's a very difficult thing. And if some of you have lost a loved one, I love this quote. I believe the hardest part of healing after you've lost someone you love is to recover the you that went away with them. Two more quotes and then we'll call it a wonderful morning. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. Keep going. Each step may get harder, but don't stop. The, be the view is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. From the top. And this is my motto. Every morning I open my eyes and I look like this. Every day may not be a good day. But dock on it, there's good in every day. And sometimes we have to dig deep. Sometimes we just have to find it. So um, at this point, this will end our morning session. What an honor it has been to be with you. I can't thank you for the way that you care for others and that you will continue to care for others. I have written two books. Uh, one book is called Your Guide Through Persian Storms, and another book is called Tools for Life. Um, books that I've written that can only, that, in my heart and my mind, just to help people navigate their journey, as we have done here this morning, trying to navigate this journey of caregiver fatigue. So family, as, as we end this session, I am so excited to come back with you and to give you 10 tools. And, and we're going to do some fun. We'll have fun. We're going to apply them. 10 tools to help you survive all the stressors, the caregiving stressors, the pandemic stressors, the, uh, and there are all the other stressors that are going on. My gosh, are we in it? Oh, I, I, I just can't go there. I'll go there real quick. I know we were deployed in New York City in the midst of a pandemic when all those riots broke out. We were, I was at a hotel right next to the Barclays Center. I could see from my hotel room the looting and all the cop cars and all this. Stop, oh my God. Stop, stop, stop. So look, anyway, it's not going to stop. But what we have to do is learn how to manage it. Managing your thoughts, your emotions, and your actions. Your head, your heart, your hands. Remember, the greatest um, gift my dad taught me, the journey between your head and your hearts. So, family, I look forward to um, being with you the rest of the afternoon. So, have a great time off. And, man, I, I just can't thank Health First Center for Family Caregivers enough. I've had the wonderful ability to meet them over the phone. And I can't wait to meet them face to face. And maybe you next year. Yay! You never know. You never know. Have a great uh, uh, session. Uh, the rest of our session here. And I'll talk to you this afternoon. Bye-bye.